Okay, right. So the first thing that is really good. If the light is on, I'm probably in here. So you do not have to stand outside, especially when it's pouring like this, right? You can just come in. It's okay. Um, I also want to talk briefly before um, we get into the material for today about, um, well, first next week, right? Everybody knows that next week I'm not going to be here, right? Next week I'm not going to be here. It's on the syllabus. So the reading assignments for next week still holds. I am going to put up videos for Lysistrata and for the Bhagavad Gita. I want you to watch them. I want you to read those texts. And I still want you to do a response paper. And you'll have quizzes on both of those that will be posted online, right? Like with the Gilgamesh quiz uh, for the previous day that I couldn't be here. So that's what's going to happen next week. Any questions about next week? Isn't it Lysistrata and Metamorphoses? <coughs> no, I moved Metamorphoses to the following week because we have students doing a presentation on that. And it would seem extremely bad form to me to not be here when students are giving a presentation, right? Yeah, I just need to so, it. Yeah, so yeah, we, I, had, I, had to, I had to monkey with the schedule a little bit. Um, but yeah, Metamorphoses will instead be the following week. Uh, OK, uh, and that, that is in the, the current version of the syllabus that's on Georgia View that is, that is posted there. Um, OK, any other questions about next week? No. OK, great. Then, because we are moving closer to midterm, I feel like we probably ought to talk a little bit about the exam and about the paper. Right, so the setup for the exam, right, you're going to be given three essay questions to choose from. You're going to choose one, right? I'm going to give you blue books and you will write an answer for that essay question that is going to be about five blue book, uh, blue book pages, right? I will give you sample questions. I'll post them to Georgia View. They'll be in the syllabus and assignments folder. Um, they'll be general sample questions, right? They'll be on thematic issues. They won't ask you to reference specific texts. The actual questions on the exam will probably ask you to reference specific te texts, right? So the sample questions, the study questions, won't be quite the same as the exam questions, but they will give you some indication as to what I actually want you to know <coughs> and what I want you to be able to do for the exam, OK? Now, the second part of the exam is going to be a set of identifications. Right? I'm going to give you a set of terms. They could be um, characters. They could be places. They could be um, sort of literary terms or theoretical terms, right? It's all going to be stuff that we actually discussed in class. So it should all be in your notes. None of it's going to come out of nowhere. And what you are going to do is take your term, and you are going to give me the name of the associated text the name of the author of that text, and then a brief but substantial definition, right? So at least give me a definition that is a couple of sentences and that contextualizes the term for me a little bit, right? right think like short paragraph, not single sentence. So if I was to give you the term polymetis, with what text would you associate that? The Odyssey. The Odyssey, good. And the author would be Homer, Homer whoever the hell he is. And how do we define polymetis? Okay, it means, it's, it's a Greek word, it means many thoughts, right, or many strategies. And what does it actually have to do with the Odyssey? Yeah, it's a term that is frequently used to describe Odysseus, right? 
Okay, so that's the kind of information you would need to give me. If I were to give you the term um, Ishtar, what's the text? The Epic yep. Epic of Gilgamesh, good. I will also simply accept Gilgamesh. Who's the author? Son Okay, yeah. You, <laughs> in the case of the Epic of Gilgamesh, right, where we don't really have uh, the text strongly identified with an author, or the original author of the myth is unknown to history, we can say anonymous, right? We would say the same thing with terms that come from the Enuma Elish or from uh, the book of Genesis, right? If we don't know who actually wrote it, then we put anonymous. Now, anonymous means unknown to history, not just unknown to you, okay? So just because you can't remember who wrote something doesn't mean that the author is anonymous. Um, and Ishtar then is who? How do we, how do we define Ishtar? Who or what is Ishtar? Wasn't that the uh, the goddess of uh, Uruk? <coughs> yeah, because yeah, she's the the goddess whose temple is in Uruk, right? And why is she important to the epic? Unleashes the bull of heaven on uh, Gilgamesh and uh, Enkidu. Yep, she unleashes the bull of heaven on Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And why does she do this? Because Yes, because Gilgamesh rejects her advances, right? Right, you would need to give me all of the relevant information you can think of about this particular character. Now, it's been my experience that the IDs are the part of the exam that students usually find the most difficult. So what I would suggest you do is study with a partner or with a small group and make flashcards, right? Go through your notes, any character we spent time talking about, any term we spent time talking about, um, any, anything that looks definable that we spend time talking about, make a flashcard for it, right? And practice with those. That seems to, be, to have been the most effective strategy for dealing with this um, that past students have found. Um, so does anybody have any questions about it? But you'll do eight, you'll give, be given uh, 12 of these and you'll do eight, right? Anybody have any questions about anything regarding the exam? Now, this all seems relatively simple and straightforward. <clears throat> okay, good. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the midterm paper as well. So I have directions for this posted on Georgia View. You can go look at them anytime you need to, but it's probably worth talking them over as well. As we wait for this to wake up. Okay, so you're going to choose one work from the first half of the semester, right? So anything that we read before the midterm exam, you can choose for this paper. And you will do a 1,000 to 1,500 word close reading of this single text, right? Now what I mean by close reading, right, is that you're not doing any research for this assignment. I don't want you going out and consulting outside sources. What I do want you doing is looking through the text and identifying a particular pattern or theme that you think is meaningful, right? So essentially what you're doing is the same thing you're supposed to be doing for the response papers, but on a larger scale, right? For the response papers, what you're giving me is a single instance of the pattern you find, right? and explaining how this gives us evidence of a particular pattern. What I want you to do in this paper is show me the pattern, the whole pattern, or as much of it as you can fit, right? And explain to me why it's important, right? What does this particular pattern tells, tell us, in particular, about the values of the culture that produced this text, right? Everything we're doing in this course is very much sort of about trying to place a text in its proper historical and cultural context. So what I want you looking for is how the, the patterns and themes in the text, or even some weird thing that doesn't seem to fit, where a pattern seems to fall apart, right? What this, what this thing tells us about 
what this culture cares about, what they value. Okay? Yeah, Bradley. Um, you said just one. Just one text. text. So you can't like do all of them. No. No. Okay. no. So yeah, like if you know, if you're particularly interested, say, in ancient Greece, I only want you to look at one Greek text, right? Yeah, so you're just going to cover one text, in part because we have this 1,000 to 1,500 words. That is, that may seem like a lot of words, but it's actually a pretty short paper, right? Okay, so just a little bit about what I want to see, because some of you are not quite doing this all the time with your response papers. Please make sure that it is in 12 point, uh, 12 point type, <coughs> Times New Roman font, and double spaced. Right? This is mostly just because it's much, much easier for me to read if you do it that way. Right? This is the easiest font to read, the easiest font size to read, and double spacing means that <coughs> poor little eyes don't get harmed. Um, standard margins, what notation there is should be MLA style parenthetical, and you are going to need to put a works cited page at the end. Right? Even though you're only citing one work, this is just a good habit to get into. So does everybody understand what I mean by parenthetical notation? Okay, so after you quote from your source text, parenthetical notation means you sort of put author name, so Homer, and then the page number, uh, 347, after the quotation, right? Now, with poetry, where we're given line numbers, instead of the page number, you would give me a line number. So Homer, technically, instead of page 340, would be line, whatever number it is, right? Now, what if you don't know the name of the author of the text? What if it's an anonymous text? Then what do you give me instead of the author last name, the author name? The name of the text, yeah, you're going to give me the title of the text, right? So if, say, you're writing about Gilgamesh, then you're going to give me, right, Gilgamesh, underlined or italics, line 1115 or what have, or what have you, right? Does this make sense to everybody? Everybody understand what I'm asking for? All right, good. Um, if you're quoting from a text and the quote is four lines or longer, it needs to be set apart as a block quote. Does everybody understand what a block quote is? Okay, this is when you just sort of take an indent into the middle of the page, and you sort of set the quote up there, and then go back out into a regular paragraph when you're done with that <coughs> quote. Right, that's a block quote. If you need examples of what this looks like, or if you're confused about how to do this, just come talk to me. Right, um, you've probably had to do this before though, so just making sure. Um, I also want you to try to integrate quotations into your own sentences. I've noticed that people will often just try to drop quotes into a paragraph without really setting them up. All I'm asking you to do here, right, is make sure that every time you quote, you warn your reader that you're about to do that, right? So you know, this is as simple as adding like a little tag to the beginning of a sentence, right? You know, as Homer writes in book nine of the Odyssey, comma, quote. Now, as far as working with quotes is concerned, right, never take for granted that your reader knows why you're quoting, right? Always explain what the purpose of this quote is for your argument, right? How does this quote advance your argument? 1,000 words is going to be the minimum acceptable word count, and your works cited page doesn't count, right? So I need at least 1,000 words from you. If you go over 1,500, like if you go a little bit over, that's okay, right? If you find yourself going over, say, 1,750, so like about a page, you know, more than about a page over the limit, then you're probably trying to say too much. You're probably trying to deal with a topic that is too big for the assignment, and you're going to need to pare down a little bit, okay? And right, finally, okay, we know when to upload it, right, by 11.59 on the due date. Okay, so here are the things I'm looking for, right? One, you have to make an actual argument here. 
So you have to choose a point to argue with which another person could possibly disagree, right? You are offering to me an interpretation of your text, right? You are not trying to argue for or against an objective fact. So I'm not looking for you to prove that something is true about the text. What I am looking for you to try to demonstrate is the importance of a particular theme, right? This is what the theme I'm talking about is, and this is why you should care about it, right? So try to answer some sort of how or why question, right? Why does the text have this particular feature, or how does this particular, particular feature operate in the text? All right, a good thesis statement is also often gonna place two ideas in, in tension with each other, right? So the first idea is <coughs> gonna be the sort of, um, the obvious surface reading, right? While the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu may seem to be, um, you know, may seem to grow into one of friendship, in fact, it continues to be a relationship of rivalry, right? Something like that. So you're gonna take the obvious reading first and try to counter it with the less obvious, more arguable reading, right? Your thesis also needs to be rooted in the concrete details of the text not some general mood or idea that you have extracted from it. So try not to give me too many feeling words, especially in your thesis, right? I don't want to hear about fear or anger or love or passion, right? I want you to be trying to trace everything back to specific concrete details in the text. Now this also means, right, don't summarize too much. I know that in some disciplines, uh, psychology for example, uh, the norm is not to quote directly from a source text, right? The norm is to summarize someone else's research. English lit doesn't work that way, right? In English lit, your evidence is the text on the page in front of you, and I need to see what you're doing with that evidence directly, right? So I need you to quote directly Right, you are going to have to go back to that source text and you are going to have to show me the passages you are using to get your interpretation, right? This is the biggest mistake a lot of people make on the first papers. They don't quote directly at all or they don't quote directly enough, right? This also demonstrates to me that you actually read the text that you're talking about and that you understood it. All right, um, right, grammar and style. Um, just a couple of quick things here. Uh, first off, right, I don't generally grade based um, on grammar, right? I'm not going to go through your paper with a fine tooth comb and parse all of your sentences and make sure that you spell everything directly, bless you and make sure that um, all of your sentences are grammatically perfect sparkling jewels, right? That said, I have to be able to understand what the hell it is you're trying to say, right? So if your sentences are a bunch of jumbled messes, you are not then communicating your ideas clearly. So I need you to make sure that you are writing sentences that another speaker of English can reasonably interpret correctly, right? It is often a good idea when you are writing to have a second reader, right? Have a friend, roommate, whatever, look over your paper just to make sure that your sentences make sense, right? Also, we all like to use big 10 cent words to prove how smart we are sometimes, right? But language is actually very, very efficient and tends to purge words that it no longer needs. What this means is that there's really no such thing as a true synonym. So if the idea you are trying to get across is better expressed by a two cent word than by a 10 cent word, use the two cent word, right? Don't use the big word just because it sounds smarter. Finally, um, I can't read your mind, 
right? That's <coughs> part of you know, this is a sort of continuation of the grammar point here, right? I can't read your mind. I don't know what you're trying to argue unless it's argued to me in a clear and logical fashion, right? So what this speaks to the organization of your paper, right? Each point should follow logically from the last, right? Don't just sort of sit at your computer a few hours before the paper is due and vomit out words onto the page, right? Because then what's going to happen to your ideas? What order are your ideas going to be in if that's all you're doing? The order that came to your head. Exactly. They're just going to be the order you thought of them, right? If you give yourself some time beforehand and mull this over and start writing early, then as you're writing, you can look and see, okay, what's the best place for me to put this in the paper, right? What's the most logical place for this to go? What other ideas in the paper is this most closely related to, right? So try to keep ideas that are closely related to each other together. It's also often a good idea to start with your second best argument and finish with your best. And one more thing, I know I said finally there, but there's just one more thing. Um, when you quote, this gets back to explaining what you mean by the quote, or explaining how the quote advances your argument. Always explain how you came up with your interpretation of the quote, right? Why does this mean what you say it means? That's not always going to be clear to me if all you're doing is quoting and saying this is what it means, right? You have to explain that logical connection. You have to provide that connective tissue. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about this? I know I just hit you with a lot of information here. And this is all online in the syllabus and assignments folder for you to go back and look over. And if you don't have any questions right now, but you have questions while you are working or while you're looking at this, please do feel free to shoot me an email. Oh, two more things. I do give um, extra credit for going to the Writing Center. So if you go to the Writing Center and I get back an email that says, you know, Wallace was here and we talked about nah, 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 then you will get uh, half a letter grades extra credit. So right, this can be enough to like to you know bump your C plus up to a B minus, right? So this is good. You want this? You want to do this? Um, secondly, I am willing to look at drafts of your paper, but only up to 48 hours before it is due. Right. So if you get me a draft 48 hours or more before the due date, right, which is February 23rd. I promise I will look at it. If you get something to me after that deadline, so within two days of the due date, um, I will look at it if I have time to, but I cannot guarantee that I will be able to make time, right? <coughs> also, the earlier you get me something, the more I can help you, right? the more time you have to put the advice I give you into practice, right? This is why I set that time limit, right? To try to encourage you that if you want me to look at something, get it to me earlier rather than later, right? You will end up with a better paper that way. Okay, so any questions about any of this? Any questions at all? Okay, so let's talk then about the poems of Sappho. <coughs> what do you think of this? How'd this go for you? It was a little rough. Uh huh. Yeah, almost all of these poems are fragmentary, right? <laughs> There's only one poem in this grouping that we know for sure is complete. There are several others that are more or less complete. There are others we can complete through conjecture. And there are others that we just have little bits and pieces of. Now, 
in a lot of ways, this kind of speaks to the nature of lyric poetry in the ancient world, right? Sappho's poems are not unique in this. If we look at um, her Greek contemporaries that we know of, their body of work is in the same condition, right? Just little bits and pieces here and there. So, when we've looked at poetry thus far, most of the poetry we've looked at has been, right, either drama, like Medea, or epic, like the Odyssey or Gilgamesh. So, when we talk about epic, what does an epic look like? What features is an epic supposed to have? Plot. Okay, a hero, a plot, right? Yeah. Epic usually concerns the actions of a hero and this hero is often divine or semi-divine, right? Gilgamesh, for example, is a demigod. Achilles is a demigod. Odysseus is not, but he's still not a normal person, right? And yeah, an epic also has a plot. An epic is narrative. It tells a story. And the story usually is about, in some way, the foundation or maintenance of a civilization or culture. Right? So even if it's not actually talking about the birth of a particular culture, it's usually talking about some important crisis points in the life of that culture and how that gets resolved. Right? Now the Odyssey may seem to be the story of one man just trying to, trying to get home after being bound about a bunch, uh, through fantasy land for several years. Right? But what he is trying to get home to do is restore his oikos, his household, right, the very basis of ancient Greek society. So the stakes are actually civilizational in the Odyssey, even if they don't necessarily appear to be. Now what we have with Sappho is an example of lyric poetry. So are any of you familiar with lyric poetry, what we mean when we talk about lyric poetry? what the characteristics of lyric poetry are. Um, it usually does, yeah. There will usually be a particular meter, right? There will usually be a rhythm, but then again, that's also true of epic. Right? Epic is written according to very, particularly Greek epic is written according to very specific meters. What does a lyric not have that an epic has? Yeah, a lyric typically does not tell a story, right? There's no plot. A lyric is also typically brief, right? And it's typically used to convey idea or emotion rather than to tell a story. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't sometimes give you snippets of stories, right? And lyric isn't just, you know, somebody going out and you know, pouring out their feelings, right? It's not just barfing out your feelings onto a page. Lyric in ancient Greece often served particular social ritual functions 
right? <clears throat> in fact, it was often more appropriate for performance on ritual occasions than epic was, right? Because if you were going to sit there and listen to somebody performing the Odyssey, right? You'd be there for days. So usually if you had someone performing at a dinner party or a social occasion, they were going to perform lyric, right? Where does the name lyric come from? Can you, can you tell? Lyre. From the lyre, yeah, from that instrument, right, that accompanied the poet in ancient Greek performance, right? And these were always written, at least for the Greeks, for performance. <coughs> they must have circulated in textual form, because if they hadn't, we would have no evidence of any of them. But they were intended to be performed. Right, so Sappho's poems in particular were written for choruses of young women to perform. Right, not, we're not even talking about poems that are written for a single performer to speak. We're talking about poems that are written for a chorus of young women to perform together, usually um, accompanied by a dance um, and by music that we have by and large lost. So the music that I was playing when all of you uh, sort of unceremoniously dumped yourselves to that door um, this afternoon was a reconstruction of Sappho's Fragment 111. Now this Fragment 111 is written for a specific ritual social purpose. It's an example of what's called an epithalamian. Right? This is a fancy Greek word that means wedding him. Right? Or wedding poem. So many of the poems that you read for today were written for particular social or religious occasions. <coughs> right. Once again, not just the poet pouring out her feelings. In fact, we can't always certainly identify the I in the poem with the poet herself. Right. The I in a lyric poem is often a dramatized character. It's not always meant to be sort of considered equal with the poet. All right, so. That's it, with that little bit of background there. Um, was there anything you guys noticed or were particularly interested in about these poems or confused by? Mm -hmm. She seemed to very love over anything else for some reason. Like, okay, yeah. I think the scene uh, the poem 16. Yeah, okay. Would you do us a favor, Demaricus, and read the first stanza of that? Okay. Some men say an army of horse, and some men say an army on foot, and some men say an army of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth, but I say it is what you love. Thank you. Okay, so what this poem starts with is a catalog of parallel statements, right? Army of horse, army on foot, army of ships. Which then leads to a superlative, right? What is best? <coughs> is the one you love. What is most beautiful to you is the one you love, right? So we have things that are beautiful, or things that some people consider beautiful, capped off by what is most beautiful, or what the speaker says is most beautiful. This is a conventional Greek verse form. It's called a priamel. 
P-R-I-A-M-E-L. And this is exactly the way it works, right? You have these, this list of parallel items, right? An army of horses is best, an army on foot is best, an army on ships, an army, an army of ships is best. Now, what do you expect would be the superlative at the end of these statements? Some other kind of what? <laughs> Yeah, in a conventional prime L, that's what, would it, what it would be, right? It would be at least some other kind of military thing, right? Or some other kind of army. But what Sappho is doing is taking the conventional form and subverting it by making something entirely different, the superlative at the end of the first stanza, right? It's not an army at all that is the most beautiful thing. It is the one that you love. And then this first stanza, which gives us this parallel list of superlatives, is then explicated in the following stanzas, right? So a preamel is it's an argumentative poem, right? You're making the case for the rhetorical case for the thing you think is best, right? Easy to make this understood by all. For she who overcame everyone in beauty, Helen, left her fine husband behind and went sailing to Troy. Not for her children nor her dear parents had she a thought, no, whatever, led her astray. For lightly, it reminded me now of Anactoria who was gone. I would rather see her lovely step in the motion of light on her face than chariots of Lydians in ranks, uh, or uh, in chariots of, yeah, than chariots of Lydians or ranks of foot soldiers in arms. Okay, so do we see any familiar <coughs> characters or events in the poem? Yeah, we see Helen of Troy here, right? Who is in Homer's Iliad the object that the Trojans are trying to protect <coughs> and the Greeks are trying to take back, right? So in the Iliad, in Homer's poetry, does Helen have very much <coughs> personal agency? She just kind of gets pulled back and forth, right? So, what kind of Helen does this poem give us? Who makes the choice here to follow the thing that, the thing that she loves? Helen. Helen makes the choice herself, yes, to go follow the thing that she loves. So it puts her and her choice at the center of that Trojan War narrative, right? This is the evidence that Sappho presents that the thing you love, right, the thing you love is the most beautiful thing on the earth, that for which you will sacrifice everything. Helen here is the example. And then the end of the poem returns us to those military metaphors, right? Right. Once again, the thing you love is more beautiful than all of these armies. So one thing that we see as a kind of theme in Sappho's poetry is taking the content of epic poetry. Right? Men, warriors, spears, horses, chariots, and reorienting it towards the world of Greek women. <coughs> to give you another example, we, if we look at poem 44, can I get a volunteer to start reading poem 44 on page 639? Fragmenting bits, just do the best you can. Kathy, go for it. I bring Harold Cain, I read Swift Messenger, and of the Rest of Asia, and Paris was strange. That's okay, it happens. Um, Hector and his men are bringing a dancing girl from Holy Feet and from On Flying Tokyo. Delicate Andrew Mac on ships over the salt sea. And many gold bracelets and purple perfume clothes and toys and silver cups innumerable and ivory. So he spoke, and at once the dear father rose up. And news went through the wise town to France. Then sons of 
it was led me up in my running cart behind a whole crowd of women and maidens and tampering ankles. But separately, the daughters of Priam and young men led horses and chariots in great style, cheer, charioteers, like two gods, holy all together, set out for Ilios. And sweet flowing birds <coughs> and Kathara were mingling with the tip of castanets and piercing them the maiden, sang a holy song, and straight up the air went the amazing sound. And everywhere in the road was bowls and cups, rare and cassia, and frankincense were mingled. And all the elder women shouted along, and all the men cried out a lovely song, calling on Pound, far shooting god of the land. And they were singing a hymn of for Hector and any one of the gods. So who's Hector? Paris is the older brother. Yes. And so in what context do we know Hector? He dies fighting Achilles. Yeah, he dies fighting Achilles in the Trojan War, right? And the first of the great Homeric epics, the Iliad, ends with Hector's funeral. So Hector's involvement in the Iliad, right, is as a warrior, primarily. Most of the time we see him, we see him not in domestic scenes, but in combat with other warriors. Right, he's the greatest fighter on the Trojan side, and his death is the beginning of the end for them. So, what do we see happening in Sappho's poem about Hector? What do we get here? His marriage to his wife. Yeah, we're not seeing the man here as warrior, right? We're seeing him as new bridegroom. <laughs> right, we're seeing a celebratory, joyful occasion from earlier in his life that has nothing to do with his career as a warrior, right? That has nothing to do with his role as a prince of Troy. That has nothing to do with, um, you know, the, ep the epithet that is usually applied to him in the Iliad is manslaying Hector because what's the thing he's really good at? killing people, right? But here, yeah, he's celebrating his marriage. And so we're taking familiar characters from Epic, many of whom we know bad things are going to happen to, and putting them into different contexts, right? Now the context here is also conventional for lyric, right? It is one of these epithalamians, or ep epithalamia, <coughs> that I talked about a moment ago, this is a marriage poem. But <clears throat> Sappho often does write in response to the concerns of sort of more martial, more, milita more militant uh, male poets. Now, what do we remember about the worlds of men and women in ancient Greece? Did they overlap much? <laughs> yeah, the Greek household, right? I'm just going to keep hammering this word home so to make sure everybody remembers it, right? Oikos is gender segregated, right? The man controls one part of the house, the woman controls another part of the house. And socially, men and women did not really intermingle either, right? Women inhabited their own social world, men inhabited their own social world. So most friendships, most social bonds in ancient Greece were what some critics and theorists would call homosocial relationships. This does not mean that, the, that those relationships were necessarily sexual. Right? What it does mean was that people tended to socialize only with people of their own gender. So the world that Sappho would have inhabited was pretty much an entirely female world. Um, this was especially true of aristocratic Greek women. And one thing we have to remember when we look 
at ancient history, right? Are we typically getting very much information from history about the lives of ordinary people? No, you know, we're not getting the life of, you know, Primus the dirt farmer on the hills of Mount Pelican, right? He didn't leave very much behind. Most of the information we do get from these texts is about social elites, right? So most of what we're learning here is about the behavior of social elites. And in ancient Greece, elite women and elite men mixed only <coughs> in their own gendered circles. Uh, for example, um, in Athens, uh, there was, uh, for a few years before they hit puberty, young girls from aristocratic families were sent uh, to a temple of Artemis outside of the city. And they basically lived as uh, feral children for a couple of years. They were referred to as little bears because the bear was sacred to Artemis. And they were just kind of allowed to do whatever the hell they wanted and indulge whatever bestial whims they had in order to get all of their nastier impulses out in order to prepare them for marriage. Right? Then, you know, once they're 13, they get to come back to the city and get married to a man who's probably 10 years older than they are. That was how things worked. So Sappho is, work, is working in a similar kind of social context, right? Sappho is from um, a Greek island called Lesbos, and from what we can tell of, you know, from what we know of her, we don't really know very much about her specifically. It seems that she ran a school for young women. And she taught dance and deportment um, and poetry and song, right? So the sorts of things you would expect, uh, say, like, I guess, a 20th century equivalent would have been something like a finishing school uh, to teach. And the purpose of the education Sappho gave her, uh, gave the girls in her school, seems to have been to prepare them for marriage. But what this also means is that you know these women form very intense bonds in this small group. And when one of them has to leave, right? When one of them, you know, is claimed by a suitor and goes off and gets married, right? She's not coming back to that society. They're not going to see her again. And so the pain of that loss is often expressed um, in these poems. Um, if we look, for example, at poem 94 on page 641. Can I get a volunteer uh, to read it, starting from, I simply want to be dead. Thank you. We've been shooting to the many tears and say it is. Oh, how many other things have turned out for us. Sappho, I swear, against my will, I leave you. And I answer to them. Rejoice, go, and remember me. For you know how we cherish you. But if not, I want to remind you. And look at the times we had. With many crowns of violets and roses at my side and through on. And many woven garlands made of flowers around your soft coat. And with sweet oil, costly you as long as you said. Okay, great. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so, this is a leave taking poem, right? The situation presented here is one of Sappho's girls who now has to leave the community, right? And it's her voice we hear first, the I simply want to be dead, right? She's crying because she is leaving the familiar world, right? The familiar women's world that she has been immersed in, you know, where she has friends, right? Where she is surrounded by people she knows and loves. And she's being taken from that world into an unfamiliar place, or into a new family, an unfamiliar family. And she's never going to see, in all likelihood, these other women again. Right? The cut is final. 
We also, though, get some indication by the end of the poem of the sorts of things that girls likely learned um, at Sappho Square. The crowns of violets and roses, the garlands of flowers. What these would have been were offerings to a group of goddesses known as the Charises or Graces. And the Graces were goddesses um, of beauty <coughs> and of sexual allure. So the flower gardens, the garlands, are supposed to sort of encourage the graces to increase the wearer's sexual attractiveness. You know, similar things with the sweet oil, right? So it seems that one of the things that was taught at Sappho School was, in a sense, you know, seduction, right? How to make yourself more attractive to a potential mate. All right, so before I continue with any of this, does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Or any comments you want to make? Anything that isn't quite clear to you? Was that stretching, Wallace, or do you have a question? No, I'm stretching. Just stretching, okay. <clears throat> anything at all? Okay. Yeah, all right, go for it. Was, uh, was, was Sappho into <coughs> It's hard to say, um, in part because we don't know enough about her life, right? And we do know that much of her poetry follows certain Greek poetic conventions, right? And we do also know that Greek elite society tended to be homosocial for men and for women, right? However, we do also know that male friendships among the Greeks were often sexual in nature. And so it's entirely possible that female friendships were as well. But we know a lot less about the world of Greek women than we do about the world of Greek men. So one thing that we do, again, like the thing we have to remember about Sappho too is that these poems are not necessarily written in her own voice. Right, they are perhaps the speech of a dramatized character. And while some of them definitely do express sexual desire for young women, others seem to express like almost sort of like more motherly or paternal concern, right? And some seem to kind of seem like they could be read either way. Like if we look at, um, oh, where the hell is it? Page 639, page, uh, poem 31, right? He seems to me equal to gods, that man. Whoever he is opposite you sits and listens close to your sweet speaking. And lovely laughing, oh, it puts the heart in my chest on wings. For when I look at you, even a moment, no speaking is left in me. No tongue breaks and thin fire is racing under skin. And in eyes no sight, and drumming fills ears. And cold sweat holds me, and shaking grips me all, greener than grass. I am and dead, but almost I seem to me. But all is to be dared, because even a person of poverty... And then the poem cuts off, right? So what a lot of <coughs> scholars read this particular poem as is an example of a suitor coming to court one of Sappho's girls, and the poetess's <coughs> feelings of jealousy as this girl is sort of going to be lured away from her community, right? It's like, this is another one she's going to lose. <coughs> this is another one that's going to be removed from their community they're not going to see again. Can you, uh, is that a hand up, Kathy? Or, yeah, go ahead. Um, so basically, is Sappho's and her girls like, kind of like geishas? You know what that is? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like geishas, right? Um... Not really, because um, geishas would have belonged to, like, would have been either shamed aristocratic women or women who belonged to a low social class, right? Um, these are elite women. These are women who are expected to find rich husbands. Um, they're not necessarily, um, I mean, they are being trained in similar arts, right? They're being trained um, in 
sexual and seductive arts as well as you know to be entertaining conversationalists and to dance and sing and do the sorts of things that their husband will want that will amuse their husbands right but because that's the elite <coughs> expectation here right they yeah they are being groomed for marriage that's the basic idea and yet when one of these girls is being chosen for marriage, it's still upsetting to both the speaker in the poem and to all the others in the community who are left behind who are going to miss her. They're never going to see her again, given the way Greek households worked. So I guess the answer to your question would be yes and no. Yeah, Bradley. Is this lyrical format, or does she just like to write and like stand as a board? Um. Well, the stanza form is really kind of a modern, like the way this is laid out on the page is a kind of modern invention. If you look at like actual Greek papyrus scrolls, lines aren't differentiated. Yeah. So what you have to know in order to figure these out is the rhythm that the line is supposed to follow. Right, so if you know, okay, this line is supposed, this is an epic, so the line is supposed to be hexameter line, so you know you're looking at, you know, like these, like 18 syllable lines. And once you hit the 18 syllables, it's like, okay, you know that goes over to the next line. Right, in part because like, you know, paper was, real, was comparatively rare and expensive, and you couldn't waste it, right? So all of this blank space to a Greek reader, right, would freak them the fuck out. <laughs> right, this is wasteful. It's like, my God, you're spending a fortune here. But yeah, paper was, was much more laborious to create. So yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, so yes, the stanza forms are <laughs> conventional, and that's how we recognize how to organize them into lines and stanzas. But they wouldn't have actually looked like this on a Greek page. Other questions? Okay, then let me just say a little bit about how we know anything about Sappho's poetry at all, right? Because as you've noticed, right, all we have here are tiny little bits and pieces and fragments. We have only one complete poem. So if that's the case, right, if we only have fragments, <laughs> then what is the likelihood of like how her work has been transmitted to us? Yeah, exactly. Through quotation, right? She's frequently quoted as an example in texts about poetry by other ancient world authors. So that's where most of these come from. This is where pretty much all of our knowledge of her work comes from. She left behind no book of her own. And then, you know, the last poem that we have here, you know, it's, you know, the, the poem that is simply listed as the new Sappho, was found like inside the wrappings of a mummy in Egypt from like the period of Greek rule in Egypt, right? So that was just like a kind of bizarre chance find. But yeah, by and large, most of these uh, are found as quotations in works by other authors. And I just want to talk a little bit about that for a moment. The full poem that we have, right, poem one, that hymn to Aphrodite, is quoted in a text called On Composition. by a late Greek author by the name of Dionysius of Halicarnassus. And Dionysius is talking primarily about styles of Greek poetry, right? He identifies three modes of composition, which let me try to spell them correctly. The first He calls austera, which, what do you think that probably translates to? Austere. 
what English word does this look like? Austere. Austere, yes. Glophira, which translates to smooth, and eucrate, which translates to mixed. And he has sets of authors he identifies with each style, right? So the austere style, he identifies <coughs> with the playwright Aeschylus and the historian Thucydides. And the austere style is full of rough consonants, <clears throat> dissonant sounds, um, and kind of military sounding, very kind of martial meters. The mixed style he identifies with Homer, with Plato, and with the orator Demosthenes. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't realize, but like the Greeks wrote everything in verse, right? Philosophy was written according to verse rhythms, as well as poetry. Everything really in Greek literature is a form of poetry. So Plato and Aristotle are writing poetry too. Now the examples of the smooth style <coughs> include Sappho, Euripides, and the orator Isocrates. So this particular poem, poem one, is given as an example of what the smooth style looks like. Right. So the smooth style, Glaphira, involves no dissonant sounds. Right. When spoken in ancient Greek, the entire poem is harmonious. <coughs> Rounded vowels. Right. Long A's, long O's, soft U's, right? And it's written in meters that the Greeks considered elegance. Right? It's supposed to have a kind of elegance of style to it. Finally, it has the effect of a continuous utterance. Right? It's not broken up by interruptions or interjections. It sounds like one voice speaking. <clears throat> so poem one is Dionysius' example of smooth style here. Can I get a volunteer to uh, read on page 637? Can a volunteer read uh, poem one? <coughs> Deathless Aphrodite of the Spangled Mind. Child of Zeus, you twist the lyrics. I beg you, do not break with hard pains. Oh, lady, my heart. But come here if ever before you caught my voice far off, and listening left your father's golden house and came. Yoking your car, and fine birds brought you. Quick sparrows over the black earth, <coughs> whipping their wings down the sky through midair. They arrived, but you, O oh blessed one, smiled in your deathless face. Keep going. There's another page. <laughs> and ask what? I have suffered and why I am calling out. Oh, you skipped something there. It's important. I, used to, I thought yeah. you were supposed to say that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and ask what? Now again. I have suffered and why <clears throat> now again I am calling out. Mm -hmm. And what I want to happen most of all in my crazy heart. Whom shall I persuade now again to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? For if she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather will she give them. If she does not love, soon she will love, even unwilling. Come to me now, 
Loose me from hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish. You be my ally. Okay, thank you. So this is also written according to a conventional Greek formula, right? There's a set of poems that are called the Homeric hymns. Though it's actually, it's questionable who actually wrote them. There are some that are still attributed to Homer, others that are attributed to other poets, right? And what these are, what these hymns are, well, what's a hymn to us? It's a song, right? Are all songs hymns? No. A secret what, song? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a, 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 a song of praise to God, right? Same thing for the Greeks. Um, you know, the Greeks uh, gave us the word hymn, right? So the Homeric hymns are poems that are written, well, songs, really, that are written in praise to specific gods. And they usually have the following features. Right? The god is addressed <laughs> with a number of flowery epithets or nicknames, right? So we have here... Deathless Aphrodite of the spangled mind, child of Zeus who, who twists lures, right? So the god is given a bunch of praise names in addition to the actual name. At the beginning of the poem. The deity is then reminded of past occasions in which he or she helped the speaker. Now, it's usually the speaker reminding the god, right? You helped me then, you helped me then, you helped me then, help me now. How does Sappho's poem reverse this trope? <coughs> this is why I wanted you to read those now again out loud. Yeah, go ahead, Wallace. Is Aphrodite? Yeah, Aphrodite is doing the reminding here, right, that I've helped you before. Right? Ask what now again I have suffered and why now again I am calling out, right? Reminding Sappho that this is not the first time she's called on her. Right? The deity is then asked to help again. And finally, the deity is reminded of a service rendered by the speaker. Right. I did this for you, do this for me now. <coughs> Does Sappho actually do this at the end of the poem? Does she remind Aphrodite of any service that she has done for the goddess? The goddess reminds her of all the time she's already helped, right? But Sappho doesn't reciprocate in any way here, right? There's an expectation of help without necessarily performing any service. Now, we know, and I'll just sort of wrap this up here because we're running out of time, that the relationship between human beings and gods in the ancient world was usually transactional. <coughs> I sacrifice a bullock to Enlil so that Enlil does not destroy my crops. But here, Sappho is just, it seems like she's just asking Aphrodite to help her again after having already helped her a bunch of times. So what I'd leave you with is think about what service Sappho might actually have rendered to Aphrodite in the past that is referenced obliquely in the poem, right? And why Aphrodite then doesn't ask for something in return. 
All right, so that said, <coughs> here are the reading questions for this Estrada. Right, remember that you will have to complete a quiz on this and on the Bhagavad Gita by next Friday. Okay. Right, those will be posted online. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about the paper or anything else, do feel free to contact me. I will still be answering email next week.